We're very happy to have our own Evan Patterson, who will be telling us about double categories for databases and knowledge representation. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. Um, right. So today I'm going to talk about a project that I worked on with uh, Michael Lambert, who was a summer RA here at Topos this, this summer. Um, yeah, and so Michael has c conceptualized and, and led this project, so largely I'm reporting on some of the interesting things he's been working on lately with me. Um, yeah, and I know we're, it's fun, we've got a pretty wide range of people here today, so some parts of the talk will be more technical than others. I'm hoping that it, everyone can at least take something away, away from this. So, um, right, so, so, so getting into it, you know, I'm going to try to describe how the double category theory perspective can unify and improve some different aspects of how category theory has been used uh, to, do, to do knowledge representation. Um, so I'm going to start by giving some background about the different approaches that, that people have, have taken to this, um, starting with the, the O-logs that, that, da that David and, and Kent uh, created, which I'll call functional O-logs. I'm going to talk about a, a relational take on that idea and then about how we might use double categories to try to put them together. Okay, uh, before I get into that though, I just want to make one point here. So I have both databases and knowledge representation in the title of the talk. Um, and, um, uh, and it's sort of interesting that, that as fields of research and practice these days, databases and knowledge representation are pretty distinct. Um, but I really think that's unfortunate because ma mathematically speaking, th th they're almost th the same. And certainly the same sort of category theoretic math can be used to talk about both. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits actually of category theory is helping to, 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 to build that bridge. Um, now there are some important differences in the way that that math gets operationalized in systems. So if we distinguish between like the, the schema and the data that's being assigned to that schema, and I'll explain a bit more about that as the talk goes on, um, it tends to be the case that database systems have relatively minimal or inexpressive schema languages but are designed to handle large amounts of data on those schemas, whereas knowledge representation systems tend to emphasize the schema, although they don't necessarily call it the schema, they might just call it the knowledge base. Um, they tend to have expressive languages for, for working with those things, and to the extent that they think about having data attached to them, that data is sort of sparse relative to, to the schema. So, so these distinctions matter a lot when you're building systems, right? The kind of shape that your data is taking does inform the design of the system, but ultimately I think that there's more similarities than difference here, and, and so I want to emphasize sort of the the unity rather than the differences. And so in this talk, I'm mainly going to talk about O-logs and sort of knowledge representation kind of stuff, but, but basically everything I'm saying applies to, to databases as well. Um, okay, so with that, I want to start by, you know, sort of from what was, at least for me in my own uh, journey into category theory, this was the, the beginning. So what first got me into this subject was this um, paper by David and, and Robert Kent about ontology logs or O logs and this is a uh, a simple and elegant way to think about knowledge representation from the point of view of category theory. So in this perspective an O log is nothing more than um, a finitely presented category or you could you can boost this you can if you want to have a bit more expressivity you can work with sketches and then be able to talk about limits and co-limits but in the basic setup we're just working with finitely presented categories, and we're thinking that the objects in this uh, category represent you know, entities or, or types of some kind. The, the morphisms between them represent functional relations between those things, and then we can express facts about those via commutative diagrams. So like here's an example from, from the paper talking about a certain amino acid and the property that its side chain has. Um, so to distinguish these from what I'll talk about next, I'm going to call these um, functional O-logs because we think of instancing these in the category of sets and functions, and so the relations that are involved are functional, as I said. Um, now, um, some years ago, 
I was, you know, learning about knowledge representation systems that are used in the semantic web, which these days is kind of the de facto standard. Well, the, well not, it is the sort of the standard for knowledge representation. It includes systems like OWL, the web ontology language, and it's characteristic of these systems, which are based on description logic, that they're, they're sort of very relational in nature. People think about, you know, um, you know, concepts which are like uh, predicates in, in binary relations and so forth. So um, to think about that from the sort of category theoretic viewpoint, um, I considered viewing, uh, instead of working with finitely presented categories, to work with finitely presented by categories of relations. And so here, um, this is building on some seminal work by Carboni and Walters in the, in the late 80s where they basically gave a um, categorical axiomization of certain aspects of the two category of relations. Um, and, but they give like an algebraic description of that so we can think of that as an abstract structure in its own right and therefore think about finitely presented ones as being sort of an, uh, an ontology of sorts. So, um, so in one of these things we think of the objects again as entities. Um, the morphisms are now relations, not functions, and, and this is a bi-category so there's a higher level of thing going on. So there are, there are um, two cells or two morphisms between relations and those represent implications uh, that one relation applies another. So that's how we would encode facts in this setup. And so here I have an example of, of like the sort of fact that you can express in one of these that like if you have a representation that you know X is the ancestor of Y, um, that, that that relation is, is transitive and that's expressed by the, exist, by the existence of this two cell. And um, because by categories of relations or they, they are in particular you know, monoidal categories, you can work with string diagrams in them. Um, okay, so uh, to compare a little bit between these setups, I want uh, to uh, point out some pros and cons of, of these sort of approaches to doing things. So in the first case, the, the basic mathematical structures involved in functional OLOGs are just, well, categories. Uh, which have the virtue of being very simple. We all know and love them. The structure involved in relational OLOGs is this bicategory of relation structure. And it must be said that it's not nearly so simple. So like the Comboni Walters paper is like pretty elaborate sort of setup to say what one of those things are. Um, you know, instance data on this uh, knowledge base in the case of functional relationship, functional OLOGs is just a functor and a set. In the case of relational OLOGs, it would be a suitable sort of structure preserving functor into the, into rel, which is uh, um, the two category of relations. Okay, so what sort of features do these systems have? Well, certainly in functional OLOGs, you can talk about functions. In relational OLOGs, you kind of can. I mean, they're not first class citizens, if you will, but you can recover, um, you, can, you can within this structure, you can you can say that a certain morphism should be um, a function by by say, asserting that it's a so-called like map, which which can be done equationally. So you can kind of talk about functions, but it, it, it's it's not sort of they're not first class. Um, you can't really do relations in functional OLOGs. You can encode them as spans, but unless you're working in a sketch or something like that where you have more expressivity, you can't you can't compose them, so you can't really treat them as, as morphisms. Um, so functional OLOGs don't, because a category is again a very sort of minimal structure, they don't really have much of a notion of an internal logic, whereas in a relational OLOG, you, you can effectively work in, in regular logic, which is the fragment of first order logic consisting of uh, conjunction, uh, true, and equality in existential quantifiers. Um, but the big advantage of functional OLOGs is that they have a very nice theory of, of data migration. Uh, this, you don't get this theory in relational OLOGs essentially because 
rel as a category or as a two category is quite ill-behaved. It doesn't really have very many limits or co-limits, which you need to do data migration. As I understand it, this was one of the reasons why David originally worked in this other setting. Okay, so kind of the point of departure for this whole talk is like, well, you know, what could we do to kind of get the, try to get some of the best of both worlds here in terms of, of expressivity and good mathematical properties? And um, the approach that we're going to take, which is really pretty natural when you think about it, is to work in the double category of, of relations. Okay, so, uh, in, so I'll say later in more detail what a double category is if you're not familiar with it, but essentially in a double category there are two kinds of morphisms, uh, vertical and horizontal, and then there are cells, uh, square-shaped cells that bind them all together. So in particular in the double category rel, you know, you have objects or sets the arrows, which I am drawing in the vertical direction, are functions. The so-called pro arrows going in the horizontal direction are relations. And finally, the cells or implications or entailments of a certain form. Um, so you can immediately see from the setup that both functions and relations are sort of first class uh, within this structure. Um, what's not so immediately apparent but, but becomes more clear as you study this is that there are a number of technical advantages to working in the double categorical as opposed to the bicategorical setting that have to do with basically the, the, the fact that, that products as well as other kinds of limits and co-limits behave as you would expect them to do in the double category but not in the, the bicategory and I'll come to that in, in time. Um, so, so uh, right, so that was sort of the, the motivation. Um, in order to, okay, so what, so what are we going to do now? Well, we want to make a knowledge representation system that's sort of inspired by the structure that's in this double category of relations. That's, that's where the rel, that's where the, that's where the instance data is going to live. But we want to be able to sort of present, you know, like by generators and relations, a, 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 um, a a knowledge base of some form, and to do that, it's not enough to just have this particular concrete double category. We need to be able to know kind of what is the abstract structure that underlies that thing, because that's the kind of structure that we're going to be working in. Um, and so in this part of the talk, I'm going to start to basically break down, well, what are the essential features of RHEL as a double category that we want to preserve when constructing a knowledge representation system based on that? So. In the first instance, well, it's a double category, but we're also going to see it's a Cartesian double category. We're going to see that it's an equipment, and actually I'm not going to talk about it because we're not going to have time, but it also has um, tabulators. Okay, so I'm going to do now a little crash course in some of these different structures. Um, if you've never seen double categories before, this will probably be a bit fast, um, but I'm going to try to at least give a flavor of what are some of the structures involved here. So. Uh, the category theorists love these very sort of succinct, cute definitions, so I'll give the one that, that corresponds to a double category, which is that you can say that a double category is a category, or really a, a pseudo-category that's internal to cat, the category of category. So why would you want to say something so tortured? Well, I mean, <laughs> the, the, it's actually, the reason I'm, I'm presenting this viewpoint on it is that it does inform how we want to think about double categories, at least in the for the purposes of this talk, right? So a double category has two underlying categories, D1 and D0. Um, and so, and, and, we, and we do want to sort of think of them that way. So, so the, um, the objects of the, category D0 are the objects of the double category itself. So we'll just denote those like X, Y, Z, and so on. Cool. The morphisms of D0 are the arrows, or the vertical morphisms. So the objects of D1 form the other type of arrow, uh, which we'll call uh, pro arrows, which is sort of motivated by the case of pro functors, but we're using it here as a generic term. And even though they're, they're arrow-like, it is actually, one gets a better theory by regarding them as objects of a certain kind that happen to have a source and a target, which is given by 
this category structure inside CAT. Um, and uh, we'll see this when we talk about, you know, the, the Cartesian structure that it's actually useful to think of the pro errors, which in this case are relations as objects that happen to have a source and a target rather as, than as morphisms. Okay, and then finally, there are the morphisms of D1, which are the cells. So the, so the domain and codomain of these morphisms are pro arrows, and then they have an external source and target, which are arrows. And so a generic cell looks like at the bottom of this picture, um, yeah, a generic cell in a, in a double category. Okay, so what does it mean for a double category to be Cartesian? Well, uh, this can be given a, a, a pretty slick definition like this. You can say, well, first of all, we can double categories and double functors, and then finally, vertical natural transformations of those form a two category, which we'll call double. And then um, we can say that a double category is Cartesian if it's a Cartesian object in that two category, which means that the the diagonal functor, the functor that makes a copy, and like the terminal functor, which, which sends everything to a point, um, have right adjoints in that two category double. And so, so that's the sync definition. What is this saying? Well, it's saying, first of all, that we have products in both of those underlying categories, D0 and D1, right? This is, so, so in the case of rel, D0 is just set, so like we can take products of sets. But we're viewing relations now as objects in this category D1. Those you can take products of. And they have, the, in this double category, they will have the, the requisite universal property. Okay, so you have products in both D0 and D1. Well, and then of course that's not enough. They need to be compatible with each other according to the, the uh, you know, external categories theory, internal category structure that's binding D0 and D1 together. So, so this implies a couple different things, but the most basic one is that like if I have two pro arrows and I take their product, then their source and targets should be the product of the corresponding source and targets. And then there are other things like basic, like you need to have that like products commute with uh, horizontal composition. Okay, so, so, rel uh, the double category of relations is a Cartesian double category, uh, as you would guess, and the uh, the categorical product product is recovered by the usual Cartesian product on sets and on relations. So, you know the the formula is is given here in sort of logical notation. Um, set theoretically, it's it's a it's a product. Okay. So, okay, so being Cartesian is a, is, a, is a key part of the structure here. Now I'm going to go to the other sort of essential part of the structure of RHEL that we want, which is that RHEL is an equipment. And there, as I'll, say, as I'll show you, there are several different ways to say what an equipment is, but I'm going to um, start with this one, uh, which is that it's a sort of uh, co abstraction of the idea, the familiar idea, that you can view a function as a relation by taking its graph, right? So in general, in an equipment, you can, you can view an arrow as a pro arrow, um, but let's look at what's going on in rel, right? So, so every function can be viewed as a relation via its graph, and then there's also the so-called co-graph, which is just the converse relation of that. Um, you can also construct that, and then it turns out that if you think about sort of what, how are these different arrows and pro arrows related in, to each other in the double category of relations, there are various, there are these sort of different cells which are giving some sort of properties about them. Um, the reason for writing these down is that they form the basis of an abstract definition for a double category to be an equipment, which basically means that every arrow can be associated can be turned into a pro arrow in two different ways, one that's sort of covariant, one that's contravariant. Okay, so for every arrow, you get its companion, which is like the, which is a pro arrow, and you can also get its conjoint, which is a different pro arrow in the other direction. Those come with 
um, the four different kinds of cells that I showed on the previous slide, and then those need to satisfy like some equations that I won't write down, but like you could piece them together by thinking about what happens with those cells in rel. So why is this a useful definition? Well, it turns out that not all, but very, very many of the double categories that one encounters in, in out there are equipments. Um, and so in addition to the double category of relations, um, the double category of spans, which is of course closely related to relations as an equipment, but then also to other things too. So like double category of profunctors, of bimodules over rings, um, as well as other somewhat more exotic things like V matrices for a monodal category, for distributive monodal category V, various kinds of structured co-span, double categories, all of these things are, are equipments. So it's a natural thing to think about. Uh, I should say here that the terminology is a bit fragmented. So like um, Schulman was one of the fairly early people to study these things. He called them framed by categories. Uh, some people have also called them fibrant double categories. The reason for the word fibrant will become apparent uh, soon, um, but I'm just going to call them uh, an equipment. Okay, so, um, so that's one way to say what an equipment is. This is a really uh, uh, nice concept because there are several other ways to state what an equipment is and, there, and all of them actually turn out to be really useful. So we want to we wanna know um, all these things. Um, so uh, in his paper, Schulman proved that um, to show that something's an equipment in the sense that I just said, that namely that its arrows have these companion and conjoint pro arrows, that's equivalent to saying that the, that the functor given by pairing the external source and target um, is a vibration, and that is also equivalent to that thing being an op vibration. So it's actually kind of amazing. Like if you just saw the second two conditions, it's kind of, you would not expect that it's equivalent for something to be a vibration and an op vibration, but there's sort of this statement about companion and conjoints is sort of binding those things to, together. Um, in any event, what, what, is, what does that mean though? So in, in practical terms, it actually translates into an operation that's, that's very useful. And um, in the next part of this talk, I'm gonna show how you, actually, how you can actually use these different operations to do sort of data manipulation. Um, for here, I'm just, for now, I'm just sort of um, describing it um, abstractly. So if it, it, it will, it'll become a bit more concrete down the road. But basically, um, this, the first of those two statements that this functor is a vibration means that if I have a niche, what I'm, call, what I'm calling a niche, so in other words, I have the part of this cell which is just indicated by the solid lines. So I have a, I have a pro arrow in and then two arrows going into it. I can universally fill that as a cell. So I can, I can, in, in this process is called um, restriction because we're thinking of restricting this pro arrow in along F and G to get um, a new pro arrow as labeled at the top as well as a cell to go along with it. And the, the notation that I'm using for that, that, that restriction pro arrow is sort of giving away the connection to companions and conjoints. It turns out that like, that you can construct that, that thing using the companions and conjoints via this formula. Um, but it can also, but it's also characterized abstractly by this vibration condition. And then, okay, and then dually, the statement that this pairing functor is an op vibration means that I can, I can universally fill co-niches. So like a co-niche is where like I have a pro arrow M and then two arrows going out of it and this is saying that I can fill that, I can extend that to a cell. Um, uh, and we think of this as extending the pro arrow M along F and G. Um, so in, in, in rel, I won't give like the for formulas for these things, but, but 
but basically what they're doing is that restriction is restricting a relation along two maps into it, in, into its domain and codomain, and extension is given by basically taking a, an, an image factorization after post-composing those two maps. Um, okay, so okay, so then we can say so that so the fundamental structure for this work is we think a Cartesian equipment. So as the name suggests, a Cartesian equipment is a double category that is also an equipment. Um, and examples of these are also fairly abundant, although um, not quite as abundant as just equipments because the statement that it's Cartesian is, is pretty strong. Um, so this does include uh, the double category of relations as well as the double category of profunctors and then, and then some other constructions as well based on spans and, and um, matrices provided that the categories that those are in have, have the right structure. Um, and this, so this, I, I'm going to make it, this last remark is sort of probably the, is the most technical one I'll make. Um, but I just want to, for those of you who may be familiar with Cartesian bicategories or bicategories of relations, um, I want to, to kind of explain how uh, these Cartesian equipments are, are uh, related to that. So, um, so Carboni and Walters, who I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, uh, introduced these things called Cartesian bicategories, which are the building block for what they call bicategories of relations. You just need to add one more axiom to get a bicategory of relations. So this is a large chunk of what it is to be a bicategory of relations is to be a Cartesian bicategory. And so they introduced these first for locally pacetal ones like REL, and then much later, like 20 years later, they, they did it for general by categories and the reason it took 20 years is that it's super technical um, and um, and so the reason I'm mentioning this is that so, so the reason it's so technical is that to define a Cartesian by category you need to first define a monoidal by category which is already a large part of the way to defining a tri category which is pretty brutal um, and they have to do that because that, their monoidal structure does not satisfy directly a universal property. So they construct this monoidal structure and then they eventually prove that subject to their axioms, being a Cartesian bicategory is actually a property. Right? They can show that if you have this structure, that structure is unique, but that's not immediately apparent because it's not done directly via universal property. Right? So the advantage of working with double categories is that you can do everything through the universal property of being uh, Cartesian, which works because reviewing relations as objects, not morphisms. That's the key thing, leads to considerable simplification of that theory. And um, as you might expect, if you take the horizontal by category, so if you take, in other words, you take the double category and restrict the functions to just, or the arrows to just be identities, you get a bicategory, and that turns out to, to be a Cartesian bicategory, at least if you start with a locally pacetal Cartesian equipment. So Michael proved that in some previous work. Um, so I really think all of this goes to show that like really most likely, instead of wanting to work with Cartesian bicategories or bicategories of relations, you want to be working with Cartesian equipments and uh, double categories of relations. Okay, so that was that was fairly technical. Let's Let's get on with um, sort of um, some examples to see how this stuff is is working. Um, so this part uh, will be will be more fun. So um, so Michael and I have been exploring how you can use this structure of being a Cartesian equipment to do operations that you might consider to be like data munging or querying, all inside that structure. And uh, because Michael's a big fan of the show, uh, Stargate SG-1, our, we have a sort of our example knowledge base is inspired by, uh, uh, you know, stuff going on in that, that TV show. Okay, so, um, so the data that I'll use to illustrate these first couple examples is, um, is the, the following. So, okay, so first of all, our knowledge base is 
let's say, a Cartesian equipment um, that is um, finitely presented. And so maybe we put in it this Fourier re relation uh, uh, about like how, you know, basically different missions that different teams uh, did in the purpose, in the course of exploring the Stargate world. Um, and, and then our instance data will be a Cartesian double functor from, from that knowledge base into RHEL. And so a, uh, and so we could c conventionally just draw that as like a table. So here's like some data you might, you might have. So I don't know, you've got different teams doing different uh, missions, like search and rescue, different locations, different dates. Okay. So now let's start to see how we can use some of this structure to do stuff. Okay, so the first thing we'll see is like what to do what in SQL is called like a select operation. If we want to, you know, start with this table and then select some of its columns. Well, how do you do that? Well, it's pretty intuitive, right? We have this extension operation. So if I start with my um, relation on the top and then extend along the projections corresponding to the columns I want to take out, that has the effect exactly of just selecting those columns. So, so here I'm taking the, the date column and the team column uh, via those projections, discarding the other things, and I get the table on the right, which is, you know, indeed two of the, two of the columns from here. Okay, now let's look at some other things. So to do filtering, like let's say we want to take this data table and select some of the rows that say satisfy a certain uh, predicate. Well, okay, in this case, we're, go we're gonna select the rows that, that, that correspond to a certain individual. So you can represent an individual as an, an arrow, a regular arrow, not a pro arrow, from, from the singleton one to the, to the corresponding type. So this individual would be instanced as SG1, uh, and then to filter those, the rows that correspond to that team, SG1, we uh, would restrict along, you know, that, that, that arrow and then, you know, producted with the identity as needed. And, and so here we're seeing that we're selecting the three rows that have team SG1. Okay, so now what about the, the bread and butter of of relational databases joining tables together. Okay, so um, this is the operation of uh, an inner join. So let's say we wanted to compute the inner join of these relations P and Q along their shared type, along their shared column type B. How could you do that in, in this language? Well, first of all, you could take their uh, product P times Q, so that's the product relation, which database people I think call like a cross join or something like that. I don't know. Um, and then um, we restrict that along the diagonal map corresponding to the shared type B. So this just, just copies, you know, sends B to like B comma B. Um, and that restriction gives you um, the, the inner join of those two tables. So let's see what that's doing if you're not familiar with joins. So like, let's suppose to make this concrete, we have two relations. So one relation here uh, connecting people with skills they possess. Um, uh, and another relation uh, connecting people to the team or teams that they uh, belong to. Um, to join these along person, we would first take the products of the expertise and membership relations, and then we're going to restrict along um, this the diagonal map on people, and that indeed gives you uh, the uh, uh, this th this result here is is the, is the corresponding inner join. Okay, so to conclude here, and I went 
quite a bit faster than I thought I was going to, so we'll finish early. Um, I want to compare this with sort of how this works in uh, functional ologs, uh, aka categorical databases based on functors from a category C to set. So in that setup, you do querying our data migration sort of outside of C, right? Because a bare category C has essentially no internal logic because it's just simple thing. Um, if you want to express things like uh, different kinds of queries or data migration, you need to, to, to use um, functors between C and some other category, right? So like in the theory of functorial data migration, if I give you a map from uh, a functor from C to D, I get a, uh, first I get this pullback data migration from uh, databases on D to databases on C by precomposition, and then these have uh, left and right adjoints that, that do fancier things. Um, so uh, as the examples I just showed demonstrate, and the double, in this sort of double category that up, we, we have sort of a different perspective, which is that these sort of various kinds of data oper operations and things like inner joins and um, you know, products and all that stuff are examples of conjunctive queries. We can do all of these inside of, with, within the internal, within that Cartesian equipment D, sort of using its own internal logic, if you will. And then, func and then by functorality of that map from D to rel, we can interpret those results in rel and get the, the intended you know, result of the query on actual data. So I think this is kind of interesting um, point of view. Um, okay, so, so that's what I wanted to tell you about today. So where are we on this? Um, we've been sort of thinking about how this setup works um, uh, conceptually and some of the things you can do with it. Uh, in the future, we hope to, to implement this stuff uh, in CAT Lab. So um, as a sort of general purpose knowledge representation system that due to its uh, you know, relational character, it should be pretty natural to interoperate with existing KR systems too, like in the semantic web. And then I also would see this as extending some of the current capabilities we have for categorical databases based on C sets in CAT Lab. This would be sort of a upgrading of that, of, of that system in some ways. Um, okay, so if, if you want to uh, have more or different exposition about this, um, Michael has written a nice blog post which just got published to the Topos blog today called Data Operations Are Functorial Semantics. So um, have a look at that if you're interested. He talks about a number of things that I didn't get to here. Um, so in particular, like the, the idea that um, the distinction between types versus propositions. So like the objects and the knowledge base are like types. And then you could think of like pro arrows into one as being say propositions. Um, and, uh, but in the double category of relations, as well as other ones, there's this concept of a tabulator, which basically says that I can take a pro arrow and turn it into a type, which is like the type of thing satisfying that, that predicate. Um, so that's a pretty neat feature because it basically lets you, when, when designing the knowledge base, you don't have to think to yourself, oh, should I make this a type or a proposition? Well, you, you, you could because you can, you can move back and forth to a certain extent. Um, so we haven't yet totally settled on like what should be like what should be the ultimate um, structure for for these databases. Like, are they Cartesian equipments with tabulators? Are they Cartesian equipments with strong tabulators? Whatever that means, um, or, or so on. So there are a lot of there's sort of different more bells and whistles you can add. But I think in this talk, I have at least outlined sort of the most fundamental structure that, that would be involved. Okay. Um, yeah, so 
thanks for attending. We've got plenty of time for questions and discussion if people want to have it. So thanks. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, so like it seems a little unnatural that like, you know, so you, you have you have some database that has like, you know, like in the example you, you gave from Stargate, like mm -hmm. it happened that, you know, you split the four columns in the yep. database into a pair, yeah. you know, pairs of, uh, into a pair of pairs. Yeah. But like in general it seems like, you know, I have like twenty nine columns and there's just like an arbitrary between like yeah. the first 14 and the other 15 or whatever. Yeah, no, it's, so a, it, yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. It's definitely, is it very much a consideration that comes up? Like when I worked on the paper on bicategory of relations, this is an, was an issue, it's still an issue here. Th there is, I think, a good way to think about this stuff, which is to basically, right, when, when you're working with things like relations, conventional category theory kind of wants to make you partition it into domain and codomain. And as you're saying, that's rather artificial. Uh, how do you decide what to put in the domain and codomain? It doesn't really matter. You have to make some arbitrary choice. Right? So like what I think we would do in practice and what we would also want to, you know, develop the math of better is um, is to like view it more from sort of a an operad point of view in that in that direction. So you, you don't, you basically don't partition. The, the reason for, for describing it in the terms that I did in, in the talk is that it's just sort of, it, it's easier to describe the basic structures involved when they're sort of biased in, the, in, in, in this way. Um, but ultimately, you're right, you want to eventually move beyond that and have a way of describing the, the relational part that that doesn't partition into domain and codomain. And like Brendan and David have done work along this line. So like they um, have studied like uh, cospan algebra structures. So like algebras of a certain uh, operad that, that are basically capturing the fact that for a lot of these kinds of things, you don't want to be partitioning the inputs and outputs this, this way. Um, but that does, um, it does lead to yeah a more sort of elaborate mathematical structure and and so at least a, at least a, a a less familiar one so I think it makes sense to start here but ultimately that's kind of where you want to go. Oh, okay, so it's not like just like when I think like one way I think of like a categorical notion of relation is just like you know a, like a you know ternary relation of like types yeah. A, B, and C is just like a subobject of the the yeah. product. Well, I mean, I mean, th that is certainly so. So, yeah, like if you want to, if you want to generalize this from like just ordinary relations to like relations in like a regular category where you're looking at subobjects of of like a, pr a product type, you can absolutely do that. So, like the the place for that way of thinking is precisely in going from like just ordinary relations to sort of a more abstract notion of relation based on sub-objects and you'll get a double category of relations and all the same abstract structure will apply. And in fact, part of what things like bicategories and double categories of relations are doing is axiomatizing the kind of structure that those things have. But, um, but you, you, you do want to be able to think about like the fact that each of, like those relations have like ports on them like if it's a ternary relation, there's like three ports, and you do need to be tracking that somehow. You need you need a formalism that can that can keep track of that stuff, so that you know how you can plug things together. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, yeah I, I guess I guess so. It just seems like well, so just basically like the amount of work in like making like the notion of an n-ary relation like primitive in this context is just like not worth. I don't I don't think it's the, prohibitive. It just would require you, you would need basically a notion of like an operad internal to a category and you I mean I'm sure there's a way to do it and we should do it but but it, it would be a bit it would be more elaborate to say what that is than, than working with the double category. Just doing like pairs of, yeah. yeah.
Yeah. Um, if I had a schema considered as a partition equipment, mm -hmm. and then I have some functor into rel, mm -hmm. um, if I had a map between two partition equipments, I could compose my map with one of them and get like a pullback mm -hmm. thing. And then you can ask whether that has access. Yeah, no, it's right. So I, I sort of motivated this at the beginning, too, by the fact that like when working with by categories or relations, you presumably don't have that capability right. because you don't have the right limits and co-limits. So the nice thing about the double category, the double category of relations and co-limit, the, the double category of relations is that it has all double limits and co-limits. So suddenly it's well behaved again. It stands to reason that you should therefore be able to get a nice theory of functorial data migration for these Cartesian equipments where you, where you couldn't for by categories of relations. So, and in fact, I think Michael has even started sort of working some of that out. Um, I think, I don't know the details. I think his view is that it is, it is doable, but we haven't, we haven't, we haven't fleshed it out. But, but there probably is, is probably possible to do that, which is an, which is another virtue of working with double categories rather than by categories here. Then you put data migration where it belongs, where like, right now we use data migration to do the query. Yeah. But you're saying like you can do all the querying kind of URL yeah. and not have to leave. Uh -huh. You only use data migration for actual data. For, for when you really want to go from one schema to another, rather than saying your query is like a little schema right. that you data migrate to. Which works. Which works. Not, yeah. Not what you, always, you want like more access to it inside yeah. the schema you're already in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. Can you recover lexicon extensions using these data operations? I I don't think you can with this I, I don't know, but I doubt it. Um, I don't know, do you have any thought on that, David? Yeah. So yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, then each like row in the database has a primary key that can be referenced by other things. Mm -hmm. But when you're thinking of a row in the database as just like an element of a relation, yeah. it doesn't really have a primary. Key. Yeah. Like for the missions table, yeah. you couldn't have something else that referenced a mission. It doesn't seem like to the tabulator would have a primary key. Yeah, but I think the tabulator would have the tabulator. Oh, okay. Yeah, but but the tabulator, like, what is it in relations? It's like the set is just the set of the tuples that are like forming the relate, right? So like, it, like the whole the whole row, if you will, is the is the key, which is what Ryan just said. So yeah. Right, so, so I think really the answer to what you're saying is, is that it may be, there's a good reason why in practice people like to have primary keys. Um, so even though the database people often talk about like things in terms of relational algebra and relations and stuff, they secretly aren't using those, right? So from the point of view of this talk, we could just instead of working in, in the double category of relations, you work in the double category of spans and then you've got your you've got your primary keys back and, and and structurally speaking as you would expect those double categories are very similar they're both cartesian equipments with tabulators um, however then your your schema category may not be like locally relational like it may not be locally processed that's right that's what you pay but the good thing is unlike the Carboni Walters setup. We're going from local liposetal by category of relations to by category of relations is super hard because you don't. Wait, what is a by category of relations that is not locally Well, okay. A, a, so a Cartesian by category. Oh, going from I, I should have I should have said Cart yeah. Just Cartesian by category. Cartesian by category, right? Like the, like the Cartesian by category of spans, like yeah. So in this case, because it's so much. It's much easier to, to define and work with a Cartesian double category that it's no problem to drop the locally placental assumption where you, right. you pay a much higher price in like 
hardness of the math when you drop it in the by, in the by category okay, setup. Great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think the locally pasetal in this setup is really, it's not really doing anything. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. yeah. 